the spirit of gratitude, I also um, you know, want to thank all of you for coming out. And it's uh, amazing to me to see uh, so many familiar faces, uh, some new faces, some faces of people I know are well steeped uh, in expertise in the legal community. And some, I hope, who are coming to it for the first time or at least to bring some new perspective and energy. And as much as I teach uh, these areas and I have a lot of passion for them, I'm very much a student uh, of them still. They're changing in real time, and I hope to explore a little bit of the theme for today under the Charter Unplugged and how these ideas have moved from the courtroom to every corner of our life. And as I'll suggest, how that then shapes what uh, continues to happen back in the courtroom and that sort of organic connection between these ideas, our lives and how they're changing, uh, and core ideas that shape our identity uh, as a country and as communities who are disparate and diverse and always have been. So in the spirit of gratitude, I also want to acknowledge the ancestral territory we share of a range of indigenous groups and most recently cared for by the Mississaugas of the New Credit uh, First Nation. And this uh, is part of another theme ongoing that I'll have a chance to discuss around what reconciliation means and how that challenges and changes some of the rights culture we've come to embrace. What does it mean to see these very same ideas from an indigenous lens, one built around community responsibility, not necessarily individual rights. So we'll get to all these uh, themes in a moment. Uh, and I wanna also give a uh, shout out uh, to what lies within that building. And I should add, uh, when I came to know it in the beginning was not just uh, as a uh, place to start my academic career and as a faculty member in the 1990s, but first and foremost for our purposes today in the late 1980s, when I arrived as a student. And it's uh, also with pride that I count myself among the York alumni community and uh, the doors that this institution opened for me and the pleasure I have to see the doors it's opening for our students over my last uh, eight years as Dean is one of the distinct and enduring uh, pleasures of being a part of this community. And I know that's a sentiment widely shared today, but I can also tell you when I arrived there, there were no windows. Uh, the, <laughs> Ivy uh, that you see and is so lovely uh, if you can transport yourself to June or July when this picture is taken, was actually planted the year I arrived. It was the centenary of Osgood's founding back in 1889. So in uh, 1989, we planted these uh, seeds as one of a series of ways to mark that occasion and of course have seen uh, this uh, remarkable uh, growth take over the building which was then renovated uh, in a fundamental way in the uh, time I started as Dean, 2011, 2012. And what was added is symbolic and metaphorical and important for our purposes, and that's windows. So the law school I knew was a brick fortress, and I had a chance to sit down with some architects of the era. And this was you know, an era that you really have to love York University to bring some affection to, a time of you know, uh, affectionately known as the brutalist movement. Uh, in architecture, lots of brick, lots of concrete, but there was an idea behind it, which is universities were about walling students and faculty off from the distractions of the world, let them come together to learn and engage in this kind of insular way. And that was a law school ideal that I lived. I didn't know if it was day or night when I was in classrooms most of the time. But of course, two Decades later, the ethos was the exact reverse. We wanted windows so our students could see out, see what was happening in society, and of course for communities to look in and see how law was affecting their life. So these new windows on justice also speak to some of the change that's happened in the Charter era. From moments when law was this exclusive body of knowledge for the esoteric and the initiates, to a time when everyone is not only touched by these ideas, but also brings their own perspective, knowledge, wisdom, experience to it, which is just as legitimate and meaningful in shaping it as what any lawyer or judge uh, might do in a courtroom. So more on that in a moment. But first, this uh, somewhat um, familiar and iconic picture I want to show to take us back to that moment in April 17th, 1982, uh, when on the lawn of Parliament Hill, 
the queen in a blustery day. Uh, and you know, you can see Pierre Elliott Trudeau's comb over wasn't quite effective uh, in that moment. Uh, and in fact, there were a number of comb overs um, on that day. And Jean Chrétien's comb over, you can't quite see here, but he's there too. You don't want to have a comb over on a windy day is lesson number one in our rights uh, culture journey. But there's something important that happened that day. And uh, there's a myth about the importance of that day. As if, and that myth would suggest it's as if with the stroke of that pen, with the Queen signing what became known as the Constitution Act 1982, that in addition to encompassing the Charter of Rights, also, for example, uh, entrenched Section 35 of that document, which is the foundation for our Indigenous and Aboriginal rights, uh, and at the time, most importantly for many, patriated the Constitution, made it a Canadian document that only from that moment on Canadians could change and that affected Canada in an authentic and domestic way, as opposed to what had happened before, which any changes, including the enactment of the Charter and these other sections, had to be an act of the UK Parliament because of that colonial tradition. And we'll see that colonial infrastructure, and now, of course, a decolonizing movement, is a backdrop for much of this story. But it took us from a community whose laws were generally shaped by and consistent with a common law British tradition to something distinct and different. And I want to suggest to you that doesn't really happen with the stroke of a pen. It comes about because of a whole evolution in society, in communities, and then, of course, has a whole impact once it's in place on people's daily lives. None of that comes from a stroke of a pen. None of that comes from words on a page. Uh, and in fact, there is this other myth that somehow those words have just an inherent and intrinsic meaning. And of course, they can't mean just anything, or we wouldn't have much to cling to in a rule of law sense. But it's surprising just how fluid and how changing, how evolutionary the process of giving meaning to those words on the page turns out to be. And in fact, Canada is distinct, if not unique, in embracing the idea that if those words on the page no longer have relevance, we just ignore them. And if we need things that you can't find in the words on the page, we read them in. So this sense of a living tree, of a document that is evolving with us in real time, is a distinctly Canadian imprint in the world on constitutional thinking. In most places, in fact, the US being one of the you know, best known examples of this, we actually have the opposite view, that the closer you are to the founders, to those who wrote the document back in the 18th century, the more real and right your interpretation of it is. So the sense that you want to stay true to the meaning of those who wrote it, notwithstanding how wrong so much of the culture and society was at that moment, from slavery to patriarchy to a number of oppressions in between, that view that if you're close to the document, you must be closer to the truth of it, we take the exact opposite view of. The farther you are away from it, the more you're living in the society in the moment, the better equipped you'll be to make sure that document evolves to be relevant and resonating. So we'll get to some of those ideas in a moment. Sorry, it's a bit of a fuzzy version of the Charter, but of course the purpose today is not to read through it together, but just to capture an idea, first and foremost, uh, which is that you can put the whole thing on a page, right? We're used to long, legally uh, dense documents with lots of heretofores and uh, whereafters, and that's not how the Charter is written. Uh, it is written to be read by everyone, and in fact our just retired uh, and much beloved uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Beverly McLaughlin, and what is perhaps her most oft quoted line as a Supreme Court jurist was in a dissenting judgment, so she didn't persuade others at the time, but it's where she wrote that the charter shouldn't be seen as a holy grail that only the initiates get to access. It has to be for the people, even if I might add she can't say it was by the people, uh, uh, because the document itself, uh, we know from the Meech Lake moment and Quebec's uh, uh, dissenting views about it, uh, we can't say the whole country embraced it in 1982. Arguably, we can't 
say everyone has embraced it now, but it's meant to be for the embracing. It's not meant to be for a priestly caste uh, from up above to interpret. Uh, and that's why you see not just the Canadian flag under the charter as it's official, and this is the official government version of the document, but you see a whole bunch of people coming together. Uh, and I wanna come back to that idea. So just uh, as we get our head around what the charter is gonna mean to us, uh, what are some examples of a charter right that comes to mind? What's some of the easiest territory if I ask, uh, what's a charter right that resonates, that you hear about, that means something as you're going through dinner discussions and uh, chats at uh, you know, the nearest espresso house? What's something that comes to mind? Right, so free speech, freedom of expression, I've got the right to say what I wanna say uh, has to be one of those core foundations. And especially in a place where we've got lots of different things to say, the oft heard refrain is, I couldn't disagree with you more, but I would fight to the end for your right to say it. Unless, unless you're actually gonna hurt people with those words. And of course we have hate speech, parts of our criminal code that have been upheld as constitutional. So part of our story is gonna be, this is so fundamental, so essential. We couldn't imagine a democratic or just society without it. Free speech has to be right there at the forefront. And yet it can't be absolute. It can't be that, for example, I can use words to so denigrate and demean a disadvantaged or marginalized group as to not only cause real pain and hurt, but maybe incite others to do worse. And we know this from lots of war crimes, lots of genocides, lots of injustices, uh, that words aren't different than sticks and stones. They actually do have as much potential to hurt. So the other idea we get from this is that whatever rights we're gonna come together to say shape us, all come, it turns out, with limits. And that's gonna cause this most Canadian of all journeys, which is how do you balance those off? How do you say the right is fundamental and inalienable, to use a slightly American term? In other words, it doesn't come from anyone putting it on a page. It always existed as something that we uh, cherished. And that's this sense that the charter wasn't just drafted you know, on the back of a napkin. It was an attempt to capture what was already fundamental to our community and yet it can't be absolute. So what's, what's another example? Right, so peaceful uh, assembly coming together, and of course, we're gonna see a mix, uh, potentially, of freedom of association and freedom of assembly come next week if there's a labor disruption on this campus. Uh, and that's become a right constitutionalized, again, in a non-linear way. There was a decision in the 1980s that said uh, you have a right to join an association like a trade union, but that union wouldn't have the constitutionally protected right to bargain or strike. Legislation, for example, could uh, order someone back to work or indicate they can't join uh, a union. And then a couple decades later in 2010, the Supreme Court said, you know what? Canadian society has evolved. We are a different place. And this notion of collective bargaining, the ability to withhold your labor if it's done in a lawful way, is something that has emerged as a constitutionally protected uh, zone. And so this is an, a neat example of where the Supreme Court in one generation came to a different view about something by looking around society and saying, we've all changed. Just for example, like the notion of extraditing someone from Canada to the US, where they might face the death penalty, which of course they would never face here, uh, was held not to violate the fundamental sense of justice in one of the sections we'll talk about in a moment in the 1980s. Uh, and then less than a generation later, the court said, you know what, Canadian society has changed. We've also seen enough wrongful convictions. We've had public inquiries on how the justice system can get it wrong that we actually say now it would shock the conscience of the community to extradite someone who could potentially be have their life taken away as a consequence of a finding of criminal guilt. We can't extradite in those circumstances. So this is another way that we've evolved. 
So a couple of other rights, and then we'll start trying to tie together what they all mean. Freedom of religion? Exactly. And I'd say this is the third rail, that to the extent there's a consensus on the others, in other words, I saw a lot of heads nodding when we were talking about freedom of expression as bedrock, and yet the need for some limits around it, that I think resonates for most of us. Religion, we just don't know how to talk about in a way that resonates for most of us. And we've seen this, of course, in the Quebec religious neutrality debates around whether you can cover your head uh, and face uh, in a courtroom or on a bus for religious purposes, whether there's a difference between a large crucifix in the National Assembly on the one hand and wearing a kippah when you're delivering public services in the other. So Quebec is just the most visible and intense version of something that is widely experienced, which is we do not know what to do with religion. So in other words, we want to protect the right of those who express their religion, but we also want to protect people from having religion in any way imposed on them. We say that we're deeply committed to protecting beliefs, but just last year in the Tunaha decision, the court said that can't extend to indigenous understandings of spirituality that would accord religious belief to the physical manifestations of the creator, including mountains and valleys uh, and sacred spaces for grizzly bears in that BC Jumbo Valley community. And the Supreme Court wrestled with this idea and ultimately said, no, no, you can believe in the grizzly bear. You can believe in the valley and the mountain, but you can't actually protect the bears, protect the valley or protect the mountain from a ski resort being built. And again, most people would say that makes absolutely good sense to someone who has no understanding of indigenous spirituality. Makes no sense at all if you look at it through the lens of an indigenous approach. Freedom of religion is about to be next week in the headlines of every social or old school media that you're plugged into as the Supreme Court releases its decision in the Trinity Western University case. So TWU, back in 2001, won a major victory in the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in the area of having its teacher education program approved, notwithstanding that every member of it had to sign a covenant indicating that they would not engage in any intimate same-sex relationship uh, and a number of other uh, what were said to be biblical uh, commandment-oriented conduct restrictions. And the BC government and its agency to accredit teaching programs, in other words, to accredit teachers, said that can't be. Our commitment to equality would preclude a university that required as a condition of participation signing such a covenant from getting that imprimatur of the state uh, given our commitment to equality. And the Supreme Court said you got it wrong. You've got to take that commitment to equality and balance against it religious freedom as Trinity Western styles itself, not just as a private university, but as an actual arm of the church. Anyway, fast forward to a period after same-sex marriage has been entrenched, uh, after, again, Canadian society has been evolving, and Trinity Western this time has proposed a law school, something close to our uh, hearts uh, uh, over at Osgood, uh, and has said that this law school is going to be a terrific example of a great uh, and principled and engaged curriculum, and every organization that accredits legal education has agreed, but there is this same issue of the covenant. It's changed a bit now. It actually precludes any intimacy outside of heterosexual marriage. So of course that includes all the same LGBTQ communities, but also, for example, a common law heterosexual couple, not married, but uh, living together, let's say. Anyway, the whole country divided on this. The BC Court of Appeal said it has to be approved by the Law Society of British Columbia. And by approved, I mean the graduates of that school have to be welcomed into the licensing of lawyers. Ontario said the opposite. Uh, and all provinces just were a patchwork quilt of different approaches because we don't know how to talk about religion. Uh, and so religious freedom is one of those examples where when we talk about limits, it's not just limits on religious freedom per se, but the limits imposed by competing rights, other rights like equality that we hold uh, just as dear. Uh, and again, 
You can look at some areas that are the low hanging fruit, getting rid of school prayers, right? The idea that we're gonna have a Christian prayer to open a, a day at a high school or uh, to open a day in a municipal council, not any other religions uh, invocation. And of course, if you don't want to join everyone in saying the Lord's Prayer, you had to sit down or go to another room. This was not hard in the late 1980s for the Supreme Court to say freedom of religion means you can't compel people to be exposed to school prayers. Sunday shopping, if you're old enough like me to remember the big furrier wars on who would get to stay open on Dundas and on Young Street on a Sunday, it seems like a quaint relic of our history. Uh, and in fact, people who are a generation older than I am remember when they would have curtains that would close the front windows of Eaton's or Simpson's on a Sunday so that you shouldn't enjoy any window shopping, never mind actual shopping. Uh, and in the cruelest turn of fate, playgrounds were padlocked, right? Because it's not a day to play, it's a day to pray. Uh, so Sunday shopping in one of the most celebrated early decisions of the Supreme Court in the Big M Drug Mark case, which oddly was somehow affirming the rights of a drugstore to, uh, to be open rather than the, necessarily the rights of people who wanted to shop there, was a low hanging fruit. Easy for the court to say something called the Lord's Day Act that privileges one religion over all others and the day of rest of that religion over all days and compels you to observe it, whether or not you're an atheist or a Jewish merchant or a uh, part of the Islamic community, you got to close on Sunday, that was easy to say it would have no place. But what people forget is a couple of years later, a more balanced version of that came out that said, well, some shops can stay open if they're small enough uh, and if they're kind of allowing convenience corner store type things, but not big shopping malls. And it only applied in certain ways to certain workers. And that more balanced view actually was upheld by the Supreme Court, but it had left the courtroom by that point. That notion of unfairness was throughout culture. And so even though they lost the court case, the next year government started taking out any Sunday shopping legislation, repealing it and replacing it with sometimes just a neutral day off at some point, or labor laws that protected the hours anyone could work in a week, but no more religious imposition. Okay, so, I've already, um, I think, given you some indication of my view of what the charter is about. Uh, it's telling a story, as all constitutions do. And it's telling a story in real time that's gonna change over time about who we are and what defines us as a shared community or a community of shared commitments. So we think of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as something that is quintessentially part of that American story. Right? It's the aspirations and also that every individual ought to be able to define their destiny free from unnecessary state interference. That's the zeitgeist. We're hearing it now, of course, in relation, as often happens after a school shooting to gun control. Is it about the state saying, we're going to impose background checks and you don't really need an assault rifle to take down a deer and all the rest? Or is it about the idea that I'm free to pursue happiness? not to have the state tell me how to pursue happiness. Well, of course, in Canada, we've got a very different narrative. Uh, so our narrative begins for the first 115 years or so with this notion of peace, order, and good government. There's no life, there's no liberty, there's no it's about you. It's just about keeping us all going. Uh, in a way that implies trust in our elites, trust in the decision makers in legislatures, in parliament, uh, trust in the idea that we want an orderly, just society, but just in the sense of democratic. Whatever people agree should be the laws, it's not for lawyers or judges to decide if those laws are just, it's for our democratic heritage, which was very much the UK approach. Nothing is supreme to Parliament. Parliament is supreme to everything in the UK until they, of course, got with the program not long ago in a similar constitutional uh, moment uh, that is part of the Brexit saga as well. And we can talk about, uh, but it's a, a side uh, strand from our story at this point. 
So we have this sense of federalism, of the division of powers, because primarily people express their differences over those first 115 years or so through the region you lived in. To be in Quebec was something vastly different than to be a maritimer or to be someone on the West Coast or that kind of prairie ethos. All those things mattered far more than other demographic and identity questions in that time. And so the main question for the Constitution was who has the jurisdiction to do things, to pass criminal code provisions or to regulate the environment or to uh, protect uh, the markets and uh, any area of life was divided between something that was of that regional local concern or something national. But the idea that the Constitution should actually tell us what's just, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, protections of equality, all those ideas were completely foreign to our constitutional tradition, no matter how much we tried to shoehorn them in. So when the Jehovah's Witness were being persecuted in Quebec in the Duplessis government era, the fight wasn't about my right to give out pamphlets as a religious minority on a street corner. It became the right over, is that a provincial or federal responsibility to criminalize giving out pamphlets on the street corner? A very odd way to have what was clearly ultimately a debate about what is just, not which level of government has the right to do it. So we went from legislative supremacy in that first Constitution Act of 1867 to those, again, of my generation, we would have known it as the BNA Act, British North America Act, and that tells you something about it. Right through to now where we have what some have referred to as a juristocracy, a judicial supremacy, the rule of law governing our core ideas and functions. We've already talked about some of the charter highlights, the areas in this document, the words on a page that have most come to shape our society and that were most shaped by other currents happening before 1982 and accelerating since. We talked about the fundamental freedoms protected in section two of the charter. We've uh, alluded in different ways to not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in Canada, but life, liberty, and the security of the person. And not to be deprived of those things, again, here is the balance, without the principles of fundamental justice being observed. So it's not that you have an unlimited right to life, or that liberty is paramount over everything else, or that security of the person, whatever that actually means, trumps anything else that the state may see as important. It's that those are the things that if they're gonna be taken away from you, need to be done in ways that protect your access to fairness or protect some fundamental truths, like you should never be put in prison for something you didn't do. We used to have a criminal code provision that said, if you kill someone in the course of, let's say, a burglary, even though it's clear you never intended to kill them, you didn't even know they were home. It was an accident. As you were trying to get out of the house, you knocked them out of the way, they fell down the stairs and died. You would be convicted of murder because that culpable homicide happened while you were in the course of committing a felony. And that's all it took. And again, under this section seven, the court said, well, hang on, if you don't have the mental state that we require to convict someone of a murder, how can we actually convict you of a murder? That can't stand. So it's not just procedure and due process, in other words. There are also some key rule of law principles that Section 7 uh, established. Equality rights, well known to, uh, again, everyone, and these are not exclusive categories. That is to say, uh, race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, and so forth, as categories on which we can't discriminate. We can keep enumerating other ones sexual orientation, for example, being in receipt of social welfare, uh, and on the list goes. And what unites all these qualities, by the way, is a puzzle, right? We, it would be easy if we could say they're all immutable. They're all about how you're born. That would make sense. But of course, religion isn't that. We change religions, we give up religions, we take on new religions, we make up religions. Nothing could be more mutable than that category. So. Very tough to say what is the theme, other than they're all super important to people, or at least they were 
1982. And of course, the uh, themes I've already suggested are going to shape the Canadian approach, our culture, that sense of proportionality, of everything having a limit. And remember the words from section one, that the Charter of Rights guarantees rights and freedoms only subject to such reasonable limits as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Yes, freedom of speech, but not if it's gonna harm people in egregious enough ways. And of course, section 33, we don't talk about much anymore, but in 1982, it was vital because it preserved that legislative supremacy, the idea that you can actually exempt a law from the charter, at least for a five-year period, five years being key because there's a section of the charter that you can't exempt anyone from that says there'll be an election every five years. So if you're gonna exempt a law from the charter, you gotta take that to the people before it can be renewed. So again, an elegant and eloquent dance of balance, of proportionality, of always having this idea of competing interests and rights. All right, so how did these words on the page through litigation and judicial decision-making in this key period in the uh, late 1980s and especially early 1990s, I should add, lucky enough to be right the time that I was in law school, you'd come to school in the morning and the entire constitutional landscape would have changed overnight and you just got used to that discombobulation being the norm. It settled down a little bit, but as I said, Trinity Western next week will no doubt make new law in the balancing of religious freedom and equality. But the big cases in that first era, for example, abortion. And that was the first time we actually saw demonstrations in the lawn of the Supreme Court of Canada. I can guarantee you in the 1950s and 60s, that lawn probably said, do not walk on the grass. The idea that anyone would be there would uh, have alarmed and puzzled uh, the court. But by the Morgenthaler case, when for the first time, Canada went down the road of legalized abortion, not by the way, by saying a woman has the right to choose what happens to her body, which is the key American debate that was of course argued in front of the Supreme Court, not in that fundamental way, but in a much more balanced way in saying, if you're gonna regulate abortion, it has to be done in a way that is fair to the women involved, to the doctors, uh, and that gets the balance right. And the process we had at the time was an opaque and oppressive one for everyone concerned. So the court struck that down, but left open criminalizing abortion in a clear and fair way. And in fact, Parliament went ahead and did that. And people forget this, that the law that recriminalized abortion uh, was introduced, but ultimately the Senate, this unelected peculiar body that shows up in the headlines every now and then, refused to affirm it, and then Parliament rose and the matter died on the order paper and never came back. So it's an interesting sideline to abortion. Due process I've already talked about, Sunday shopping, school prayers, uh, prostitution. The idea of saying to someone, uh, especially sex workers, that the only way you're gonna be able to engage in this activity is in the most unsafe way possible, right? Where you can't simply openly engage in activities and so you have to be make yourself subject to all sorts of unsafe environments was compelling and the law was struck down that criminalized the women involved. There are still other ways of criminalizing those who are profiting and being predatory within this context, but not the actual groups of individuals who are asserting their right uh, to engage in activity in ways that are safe. Rights of refugee claim and same-sex marriage and of course, in ways that we found so compelling uh, a couple of years ago that launched a whole legislative rethink of how we die, the Carter case and medical assistance in dying. So these are just some of the areas that have gone off the words on the page to affect our lives. Uh, and then of course, I wanna share some areas that many of us expected the charter to deal with that remain unfinished business or untouched or areas that were just too difficult or too challenging so far uh, to cover. And these include, for example, the socioeconomic equality question. Can we have a society that we say is just and fair that allows people 
to endure deprivation while others enjoy the 1% lifestyle? Uh, at some point, does that have to become a discussion about what the state does to facilitate those structures? They don't just happen. It's not the law of the jungle. It's the law of a regulated set of market institutions that build in the rights that ultimately lead to that inequality and is challenged every now and then uh, in ways that, again, will continue to grow in intensity. Uh, will the Supreme Court be captured by the Occupy movement at some point uh, is the question. The flip side of that, property rights. They exist in the US. You've got a right to your slice of the pie. In Canada, there was a very deliberate choice to leave property rights out of it. Property rights in the US, by the way, were what was asserted in the famous Lochner case back in the early part of the 20th century to deny any workers' rights whatsoever. Right? It's the freedom of contract. You can't have the state getting in the way of what an employer and an employee decide to agree upon, even if it's massively unjust for that employee. And again, that took a generation in the US to overcome. Canada wanted no part of it. So there are no property rights protected in our Constitution. It also means there's no environmental rights. Right? I can't have the right to property, but I also have no right to land use that is going to be protective of my health and well-being. Right? We have no way of protecting through constitutional means yet our right to air, to be free from climate change and its harms and so forth. And David Suzuki and his foundation launched a blue dot initiative you may have heard of to institute a constitutional amendment that would build in precisely those kinds of rights. It seems so bizarre to me that in 2018, we treat other sentient animals, and in fact, animals that aren't sentient, uh, but exist all around us, as nothing more at the end of the day as a matter of law than property, right? At a time when we would recoil with horror at the idea of a legal structure that legalized slavery, for example, we raise barely a peep when it comes to everything from factory farming to animal cruelty. Uh, and again, when we try to regulate those things, we ultimately are regulating it on the basis that it's someone's property and you can't harm it. Not on the basis that there is an intrinsic worth to every living thing that is deserving of dignity and protection. And why don't we have such a right? Well, how could you and be like an omnivore, never mind a carnivore? Right? How can you protect something's inherent dignity and eat it for dinner uh, is something we can't get our mind around yet. But that clearly is territory that will come. I say to every first year class on the first day of law school, think of the thing that you can't believe smart, principled people ever put up with. And it may be gender inequality or the oppression of LGBTQ communities or racial minorities or religious minorities or putting up with uh, all sorts of uh, degradation and pollution of the environment around us. We say, how did you wake up every day and just like flick cigarettes out of the car and leave them on the, we just, how did you do that? How could you walk by something that said whites only in the water fountain and say, you know, I'm just on my way uh, to, to lunch? How did you not just stand up and fight all of that? And I say to them, Put yourself 25 years into the future, and you're having this discussion with a 23-year-old on the first day of their law school experience, and what are they going to say to you that they can't believe you woke up and did nothing about and just were fine going through the day? Is it communities living in appalling and squalid conditions without access to housing or the basic necessaries of life? Is it factory farming? Is it strip mining? Is it pipelines? Is it something we haven't even figured out? Is it attachments uh, to connected networks that allowed all of us to become uh, marketable, commodified devices for Google and Facebook, as Paul McDonald was talking about in this room just before. It will be something. The idea that we have rights to get on our high horse and say, we've sorted it out. It's every other generation that just didn't have the wisdom and foresight that we enjoy is a hubris that I don't think has any foundation in our lived experience. And so the Constitution, has to help shape that story. And so when I talk about 
what comes out of the courtroom, what I'm getting at is that sense of how much of our life, discourse, culture is now shaped by these charter debates. So that sense of balance and proportionality is just so ingrained in the Canadian psyche. The idea of absolute rights, that there is no other valid argument, there is no other side that we need to respect and validate, frankly just sounds un-Canadian. It's not just that we say sorry when other people bump into us. Uh, it's that there is a genuine origin story to this country that began something along these lines. We were all thrown together. In no way, shape, or form did we choose to be together. This wasn't a story of people landing on Plymouth Rock and saying, we want freedom. This is a story of a whole bunch of people who were colonists uh, from France, from Britain, who shared almost nothing in common, a whole bunch of indigenous communities who didn't want them on their land, a whole bunch of immigrants who came from all over the world, not because they deeply wanted to be part of French and English society, because they wanted to get out of oppression and pogroms and suffering and lack of opportunity. None of these people got together one day and said, boy, do we want to share you know, a city together. So how do you make sense out of all of those disparate minority interests? Well, you come up with things like federalism. We'll all find ways to govern ourselves and get along together. And later you come up with things like reconciliation, inclusion, equity all driven by this idea of how do we respect, protect minorities, and treat everyone as if they belong, because the flip side is no one actually has an ownership interest. And this is how every Supreme Court decision on Aboriginal and Indigenous rights, bless you, starts off. It starts off by saying, we've got irreconcilable stories about whose land this is and who has sovereignty over it. We're not going to solve that on the words of this page, but none of us are going anywhere. Indigenous communities aren't going to pick up and leave areas that have been home for centuries and millennia. Uh, those who arrived two weeks ago as a refugee aren't going to pick up stakes and go back where they came from simply because they are an unwelcome settler in unceded Indigenous territory. And those who are settlers and can count back the generations to the 18 or 1700s have no less right to call this home uh, as anyone else, arguably. So all of these constitutional stories in one way or the other are about respecting that sense of minority interest and belonging. Uh, and of course, if we can't sort it out, if it's too hard, and reconciliation is a great example of something just too hard, then we fall back on another great Canadian device, and that's called procedural justice. We'll just have an incredibly fair way of talking about it, right? It's like labor negotiations or disputes over the uh, pipelines between, you know, wine and, uh, and steel in BC and Alberta. We've got to find a way to resolve these disputes that balance rights and ultimately come up with things that we can live with as fair. That is the Canadian way as much as anything else is. And of course, as that culture shifts, we bring it back to the courtroom. So if you're looking, where is the charter going to go? How is it going to evolve? What are the next thresholds? Here are just a few of the ones that have jumped out at me. Uh, and again, when we have the Q&A in a few minutes, I'm hoping you can share either comments on where you think we're heading, where we ought to head, or feel free to probe and question some of these instincts. But the Me Too movement, of course, is reshaping our understanding of the criminal justice system, not to mention the Stanley and Cormier trials and the tragic loss of uh, the Bushy family and the Tina Fontaine's family. These are leading mainstream Canadian, whether it's legal or dinner table conversations, to say something is unjust going on about how victims, survivors, are treated because in a way of our over-determined commitment to due process to those caught up in the criminal justice system. We've got fairness right, but there's another side to that equation too that we may have lost sight of. Uh, and in fact, many people deeply believe we've lost sight of. Not having any indigenous member of the jury in the Stanley trial has led many to question, can that be fair? Can it be fair to try to understand the context in which that victim lived 
his life and the alleged perpetrator came to take his life without having a single person, visibly anyway, on the jury who has shared any of that experience. So the focus on survivors, the focus on victims is a new area for constitutional thinking and balancing, again, those fundamental rights. More of that focus on collective rights, things that aren't about me as an individual, but us as a community. And of course, the environmental rights are uh, front and center. Climate change doesn't happen to me. It happens to us. And the tragedy of the commons, the idea that, well, it's not about me using a gas lawnmower. I'm not doing real harm. Look at INCO. Look at you know, this uh, place. Look at China. Look at India. None of us can somehow fix it. So none of us have to care about doing our thing is, of course, a road down which we've already seen grave threats to our very survival. So the sense of collective rights may well come to shape the 21st century, just as individual rights from the UN to the Brown and uh, Board of Education case in the US, civil liberties, civil rights, all of that's built on the foundation that I as an individual and the key, and in fact, individual takes its meaning from that which is indivisible, not that which is part of a collective whole from which we can never be disaggregated and separated. That may be a big ticket change. And of course, more focus on that sense of how the indigenous community sees law, including through that collective lens. And the Wahanganui case from New Zealand has sent ripple effects throughout the world where for the first time a river was granted standing as an ancestor to a Maori community over which they have standing in a courtroom to argue for the welfare of that river against those who wish to develop and dam and otherwise engage in those areas. So at a time when we're saying objects of religious belief to the Tanaha can't be a subject of constitutional protection, New Zealand's gone in a very different direction and of course these effects are global, not just Canadian, uh, as we move in a different cultural direction. And finally, when you ask people what's the most important right you have, it's actually not common for anyone to say religious freedom or freedom of expression, or in fact any of these charter rights. We talk about the exact things that the charter doesn't actually touch, like my right to health care, my right to be well, my right to have a roof over my head my right to the basic necessaries of life, or if I'm living with a disability, or I'm an infant, or I'm elderly, and actually my life requires care from someone else. That in other words, left to be an individual, indivisible and on my own, would be a death sentence. Because we actually, none of us, have ever lived a life individually. There's not a single person in this room that would be alive if we actually took seriously the idea that we live as individuals because we never would have had a single diaper changed, a single bit of nourishment uh, from uh, infancy. Uh, and of course, for many, that sense of care and being part of caring relationships is a necessary fact of life throughout their opportunities to realize their full potential, depending on a disability they live with or illnesses that may befall them at different times. So we have this myth that we're individuals that totally resonates not at all with our lived experience. How do we do that? But we have a whole right structure based on the myth, not on the reality. So all of these liberties we've been talking about in the charter are negative liberties. The right to be free from things, not positive rights, not the right to have things. Like, for example, the state provide the wherewithal for me to be healthy, well, and whole within my community. So I said this is about the charter unplugged at the outset, but of course the conclusion is the very opposite is true. The charter is deeply plugged in. And in fact, the defining factor, if you want to understand this evolution of rights and how they left the courtroom and came to every corner of our life, it's precisely because of the currents moving back and forth on this cultural grid between how we live our lives uh, and how these constitutional ideas get expressed. Sometimes in the courtroom, sometimes in our living room, sometimes in how we interact and have disputes with one another, but all deeply, organically, and holistically tied to each other 
And that will, of course, be true in even more intense and unexpected ways as we go forward. So wanting to leave a moment or two for some questions, let me finish there and say what a pleasure it's been to enjoy the York experience with you this morning. <laughs>